<laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, sorry. Apparently, I made a um, yeah a mistake with the microphone. So um, yes. Anyhow, so as I was saying, I was just presenting the plan uh, for the talk and say that the, the first part is really just going to be the basic coordinate about non-commutative geometry. And as I said, the main point is that spectral triples encode gauge theories. And this is why it's natural to look at other constructions relating with gauge theories and try to see whether they fit in this framework. This is why the second part is going to be about the BB construction. So just giving, as I said, the main points and what I really want to indeed transfer in the language of spectral triples, which is going to be the third part of this talk, where I will introduce the, what I would call this a BV spectral triple and a total spectral triple constructed to indeed encode, let's say, ghosts and ghosts for ghosts in this formalism. And uh, then a part, uh, if times allow, will be about indeed how BV and BRC cohomology can uh, be described in this formalism. So as I said, uh, we start a little bit with non-commutative geometry to be able to present the main protagonist. So as everything, so when there is a new notion appearing in mathematics, one can think, okay, where does it come from? And when asked to say why he uh, Kahn thought about introducing spectral triple, his answer was really somehow going back to physics. Because uh, the idea is that somehow one can see that there is a duality between, I mean, sorry, let's say a difference between uh, the uh, um, fundamental forces in physics. So if on one side one can have a gravity that has a somehow continuous nature and can be described very well in the framework of Riemannian differential geometry, so something that is commutative, if one actually look at fundamental interactions, somehow sees a, a different behavior appearing, so somehow discrete nature and non-commutativity entering the game. So then the main the idea was actually try to introduce a more general notion that could be able to, I mean, capture non-commutativity as well as discreteness. So this is why I was saying that for my angle to non-commutative geometry, this can be seen as somehow an extension of classical differential geometry. So of course it's not really a proper inclusion, but it's like more a conceptual perspective. So, but what do I mean? So as I mean, there's this kind of general idea of going from the classical notion of a manifold to another term describing, uh, as I said, another object describing algebraic terms. So just uh, thinking to use a topology, classical differential geometry, the, the, the basic object is we start with topological spaces, point and charts. So this part of geometry we want to translate in algebraic concept. So what is going to play a role is the notion of sister algebra. Of course, a sister algebra is, is quite a complicated object, so it has a, a rich structure, but uh, is uh, allowing me to somehow explain what I said before. So why we are going to introduce a concept that allows to speak about finite and infinite dimensional object, commutative and non-commutative, because just a sister algebra itself can be commutative, non-commutative, finite or infinite dimensional. So uh, the idea is that we all know that somehow uh, classical topologies, uh, a locally compact also space, can be viewed as a commutative sister algebra. Of course, so this is somehow a translation of what I said, a topological concept in purely algebraic terms. Of course, uh, here the main point is that we are speaking about commutative sister algebras. However, once we are on the side of uh, algebra, commutativity is a fantastic property, but it's not necessary. So one can really wonder, okay, what happens if I drop this extra property and I speak about non-commutative sister algebras? And so this is actually what one can think about as a non-commutative topological space. Of course, I mean, the idea is that there is no intuition anymore, so there is no, like, um, uh, geometric realization is really ju just some kind of uh, intuition of what we are doing. So that's, it's a really purely algebraic object. 
And here is why uh, one can see uh, spectral triple as uh, non-commutative manifolds. And here is uh, just a reconstruction theorem by Kahn that uh, allowed to say that indeed a compact Riemannian spin manifold can be viewed as what he calls a canonical spectral triple. Uh, so here, somehow, I, t I tell you how, given your Riemannian spin manifold, you can construct a canonical spectral triple. Of course, the main part is this reconstruction part. But in this kind of uh, perspective, indeed, the idea is that, um, once again, one can take, uh, let's say, a manifold, of course, with uh, extra structure, but uh, somehow uh, translate that in algebraic terms. And once again, you see that here we are given with a commutative object, and one can try to enlarge the uh, situation and actually drop this commutativity condition and speak about perhaps indeed non-commutative, where non-commutative is going to be the algebra, spectral triple, and looking at that as a non-commutative manifold. Okay, so this is the intuition of what is going to be the main object of this talk. Uh, I will, of course, give you the definition. So the proper definition of spectral triple is that it's an object, I mean, with three elements, where the first one is an involutive unit algebra, and we ask that it's faithfully represented as operator on Hilbert space, which is going to be the second uh, object in this triple. And the third is a self-adjoint operator with a bunch of extra properties regarding uh, the compact resolvent and then other condition on commutators with elements in the algebra. So that's the definition. And as I said, so this is going to be for me the, the main object, uh, but just to completeness, of course, no commutative geometry is a very big field. So I'm just very much in a teeny tiny corner here, namely on how this uh, uh, field relate with gauge theories. And the relation is the following. The point is that each time you are given a spectral triple, this encode a gauge theory. And here is the recipe. So given a spectral triple as above, one can construct a gauge theory, x0, s0, g, consisting of these three elements. So the first one is a configuration space. This is constructed by, cons by taking what are called the inner fluctuations here. So we are taking element phi that can be written as uh, sums of product of an element of the algebra times this uh, commutator with operator d, uh, plus the extra condition of asking that they should be um, self-adjoint with respect to the star operation that we do have in the algebra. Uh, the second um, object that we need is an action functional for our theory, and what we take is what is called a spectral, a spectral action. So namely, the trace of uh, certain function in uh, the um, operator. So here I'm already somehow cheating because I'm saying, I'm telling you what is, is going to be in my module, of course, in my model. Uh, of course, uh, there is a very generic definition of spectral action, and as you can imagine, so the kind of function that we are taking, it should be well behaving, so it should indeed have been uh, allowing to uh, consider this kind of uh, uh, structure. So, but as I said, so this is um, going to, to would be taking me too far. So for now, this is the kind of uh, model I will be using. And the what? Oh, sorry. In my model, because I will consider finite spectral triples. So that's the key point. So if you are, are considering a finite dimensional algebra, so you're dealing with matrices. If you are considering infinite dimensional algebra, of course, you have all the analytic parts to consider when you're defining that function. So this is where the two definitions somehow split. But in my case, it's just going to be a polynomial. And the third ingredient, of course, is a gauge group and is given as the unitary element of your algebra. Uh, so the idea is that, as you can see somehow, the notion of gauge theory I'm considering in this case is really doesn't involve uh, principal bundles. Or, so it's really just uh, somehow in the really basic term of configuration space, uh, a gauge group that acts on that, and uh, an action functionals that is invariant to the action of the gauge group. So this is what is going to be a gauge theory. And this is somehow the recipe for telling how given a spectral triple, you can construct a gauge theory. Yes? I'm going to tell that in a second, because of course, the question is, does that work? I mean, does that encode uh, physically relevant models? 
Uh, so a bit of story. I mean, uh, of course, the beginning goes back to the 90s. So Khan was the one having this idea of trying to see what happens if we take things slightly non-commutative. The second big step to remember is, was indeed the introduction of this pattern action principle. So the idea of how to encode the action functional in this language that this days back to Shamsalin and Khan. And uh, with uh, many, many steps in between, in uh, 2007, Shamsalin Khan and Marcali arrived to actually describe the full standard model of particles in this way. So namely what they managed to say was that, okay, we do have two parts. M, that is uh, going to be a compact Riemannian spin manifold. I told you when you're given this uh, um, geometric object, you can construct canonically a canonical spectral triple. And this one uh, somehow is going to be responsible for the gravitational part. And then we do have a second part that is a finite non-commutative space and is look like that. Uh, I mean, it's a finite uh, algebra and then we do have Hilbert space and extra ingredients. So somehow you see that 96 is because we do have 96 uh, particles, and if, if you take the unitary element of uh, this algebra, you get the gauge group of uh, the standard model. And what they prove is that if you um, construct the action functional for this pair, so these two spectral triples, then you reconstruct the Lagrangian of the standard model. So I would say that, yes, somehow you can capture uh, interesting um, physical models. No, of course, I mean, in their case, the whole point is that, I mean, my definition was uh, for this part, how you do recognize when you have a finite uh, algebra. Of course, when you're dealing with the infinite dimensional part, so the action is still trace of a function of your operator, but of course, the property that this function has to satisfy to make that analytically well-defined are more, so you need some kind of cutoff. <laughs> Yes, yes. So the gauge symmetry here, you see, I mean, the unitary uh, elements of the algebra is really that gauge group. Uh, uh, okay, let's, uh, yes, okay, the idea is, I was going to uh, introduce that later. So it's part of that, uh, so the action functional uh, of the standard model can be reconstructed from this spectral triple. Part of that is seen as a spectral action, part of that is going to be what I will tell you in uh, in a second. So, yes, sure. No, uh, yes, yeah. Okay, so um, uh, le let me take this question into side. So what I wanted to say here is only that given a spectral triple, you can always construct these three ingredients uh, which encode the idea of uh, a gauge theory. So indeed a spectral triple has inside itself a gauge theory. If you want to describe the full standard model, actually, yes, you do something similar. Of course, the caveat is that uh, as I showed you, you have somehow two components, uh, so you have, uh, you know, to construct the gauge theory for what is called uh, almost commutative spectral triple. So you have the commute, so the commutative infinite dimensional part, the finite dimensional part. So things should be well combined between the two. And uh, as I will tell you in a second, also for the spectral, uh, so for the action is not enough to take just a spectral action. There will be another ingredient entering, another notion of action that one can construct given a spectral triple, and that is also contributing to uh, this. Um, so the standard model is slightly more complicated. But I mean, the key point is that uh, um, in non-commutative geometry, there are two notions of action you can attach to a spectral triple. So here I only presented you the first one, and uh, you will see the notion of the other coming. And with the two of them, you can indeed describe the full standard model. Yes. Yes, I mean, uh, of course, this is. Uh, 
yeah, I mean, this is of course, uh, uh, this is telling that this, um, there are promising results, but still a lot that has to be done. Of course, one of the main problems still open in non-commutative geometry is to be able to describe Laurentian. So having a, like a Laurentian version of all of that. So that's, let's say it's, it's telling that somehow this geometrical structure capture interesting models, but of course there is a lot of, uh, that is still waiting to be done. Yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah, but the whole point was just to say that indeed, I mean, uh, there are interesting models to consider, and of course that was in 2007, so things continue, so other people joined the crowd and uh, tried to go somehow beyond the star model, relaxing some of the conditions that appear in the notion of a spectral triple. And yeah, the, what I, uh, I wanted to stress in this moment is that uh, somehow, when uh, we look at the non-commutative geometry, we do have this uh, kind of two possibilities. So given a spectral triple, we can try to have an infinite dimensional algebra or a finite dimensional one. And of course, one at first look might think that the finite case might be just mathematically simpler, but maybe physically not so relevant. However, as I showed you in the previous description of the standard model, somehow, one can see that actually the final spectral triple was the one encoding the particle content of the model. So this is why indeed something that might look uh, a little bit, I mean, trivial or easier can actually be uh, still relevant to consider. And this is indeed going to be the uh, setting we're going to consider, so the case of finite spectral triples. And uh, so this is uh, the model I'm going to consider. So for me, the gauge theory, as I said, is not involved in bundles, but it's just really our uh, initial configuration space. So in our case, it's going to be an affine space. The action function is going to be a regular function over the initial configuration space. And the gauge group is going to be UN. And uh, this is actually indeed, indeed the gauge theory that one can construct by applying the recipe I showed you before, starting with this uh, uh, finite spectral triple. Okay, so now that we know exactly what is like the main protagonist of the story, let's see what we want to do uh, with the BB construction. Of course, I mean, there are several experts in the field, so we'll be just quick on this part, just giving the basic coordinate for the few that maybe um, are not so familiar with that. So the context where we are is the context of quantization of gauge theory via the path integral approach, where here I just wrote the expectation value of a regular function over the configuration space. And uh, uh, so here is where the action appears, here where the configuration appears. And uh, uh, the red of the measure is just because, of course, as we know, it's not well defined. So possibility to deal with this problem is the via perturbative approach and using Feynman diagrams, where we go from a not really, not well-defined integral to a sum of taking over critical points of the action functional. And the only problem, of course, is that we should ask uh, not copying anymore. Okay, uh, so of course this works when we consider uh, isolated points for uh, critical points for the action functional and uh, if they are also uh, regular. So of course a uh, uh, second problem appears when we consider gauge theory and uh, this is due to the fact that critical points appear in orbits, so they are clearly not isolated. So how to solve this problem? really not coping. Uh, so one can have a first uh, approach. So how can we get rid of these redundant symmetries? And an idea, of course, can be, um, let's be brutal and uh, quotient, but of course, often from a mathematical point of view, we don't get nice objects to deal with. And here is where the BV idea uh, appears. So let's just try to add uh, more variables and see what happens. So mathematically, we speak about auxiliary variables. Physicists got a way cooler name, so Gauss fields, and let's keep the cool name with us. So for me, a Gauss field is just going to be something characterized by a Gauss degree, an integer, and a parity, and we ask that 
mean the parity represents somehow whether we are dealing with a bosonic real variable or a fermionic Grassmannian one, and then uh, the degree and the parity should be coinciding with mod Z2. And here, of course, uh, just a bit of uh, history for being symmetric with the non-commutative part of the story. So uh, the initial idea goes back to Favier and Popov, who were the ones suggesting to introduce these extra variables. Of course, just going very briefly through the main point, um, so f uh, was that, I mean, they introduced this uh, fermionic ghost fields. Uh, but then, uh, got suggested to actually keep going and try to introduce also ghost for ghost when needed, when somehow there were redund even more redundant symmetries in the action functional. And here is where also cohomology uh, complex appeared. So that's going to be like the uh, second ingredient. Uh, so the, what is uh, going to call this BRST cohomology, actually in degree one is just a Chevalier Allenberg, but of course uh, uh, it can get more complicated with higher uh, order ghosts. And then we do have uh, the anti bracket structure appearing, and finally the complete formalism with ghosts, anti ghost, anti fields, and so on. So the whole story actually wants also us to speak about the anti-ghost field. So given a ghost field, you can construct the corresponding anti-ghost fields that I will denote with phi star uh, with this kind of uh, condition. So I need to characterize but, uh, what is uh, called its uh, ghost degree, so which is minus the, the degree of the corresponding ghost minus one. So with this shifting. And then the parity is, of course, uh, uh, consequently, so the opposite parity of the corresponding ghost. So somehow the, uh, the key point of uh, the BV formalism can be viewed as the, this uh, BV extension from our initial configuration space to an extended one with ghost and ghost for ghost. So the idea is that we start with our initial data, so a field configuration space, uh, an action function and a gauge group, and we want to extend it uh, to a new uh, space that I will denote with a tilde. So a tilde is going to have our initial fields, ghost, anti-ghost, and all the package that is needed, and a tilde that is going to be our initial action plus extra terms. Uh, as I said, this was just uh, uh, to put few coordinates on the table, and of course the BB formalism can be um, approached from different perspectives. Uh, of course, here I'm just referring to the more um, mathematical approaches. It's definitely not uh, a complete picture, it's just to give some uh, coordinates, and then of course there is all the physics part of the story. So what I will be considering is actually uh, this approach, so this uh, algebraic approach that turned out natural when you, uh, you study uh, finite, uh, um, finite dimensional gauge theories. Okay, so that's uh, the key step going from our initial configuration space to S0. So as I said, this is my model. So this is the uh, gauge theory you uh, constructed starting with a finite spectral triple over uh, uh, matrices, a matrix algebra. So what one introduced is what is I called a tilde. So this is a z graded super vector space. So um, uh, of course, so something that can be written in this way. So the condition is that in each degree is finite dimensional. And then I'm also asking an uh, uh, extra condition about uh, this, uh, this splitting here. So I'm asking that a tilde should, can be viewed as a direct sum of two parts, where this uh, f is a graded locally a free OX module with homogeneous component of finite rank. And this is what is encoding the fact that for each ghost field, we are also introducing the corresponding anti-ghost. The other condition is that we are not changing what is happening in degree zero. So in degree zero, we have only our initial fields. And for what concern as a tilde, this is asked to be a degree zero function over the um, space of regular function, over including ghost and ghost for ghost such that, yes. And not at this moment, they will be appearing later, but uh, in this first construction, uh, uh, not for now. Uh, yes, exactly, for degree zero, the action functional uh, doesn't change, so we still have our initial physical action. 
And then the, uh, the third part uh, is uh, what happens for uh, these uh, brackets. So these are one degree for some bracket structure. And we are asking that our tilde uh, satisfy the classical master equation. And uh, it's exactly this condition that allows us to say that actually each time we're given uh, a BB theory of this kind, we also have what is a BB complex associated to that. So the BB complex is um, uh, just the following uh, cochain uh, cohomology complex where the cochain spaces uh, in degree i are the um, part of degree i of this uh, graded algebra. And the cobandary operator is really coming from taking the brackets uh, with our um, action. And the fact that this is a cobandary operator really uh, comes from the fact that a still has been taken to be a solution of the classical master equation. So these are the first uh, two steps. So first, introducing everything is needed. So this uh, goes and goes for goes, and then having this uh, complex. Of course, one can uh, wonder why do we have all of that? So of course, one can also see one of the many perspectives. You can see like the BV formalism as some kind of a cohomological approach to deal with gauge symmetries. And indeed, uh, what happens uh, if we look to the cohomology group? So we see that in degree zero, in this case, we're actually dealing with classical observables. Uh, question is, how can we determine all of that? So I just give you the definition of what I want to be our X tilde and S tilde. The, uh, the question is, how can we determine how many and which kind of ghosts and anti ghosts we want to introduce? And the answer are so that uh, the uh, ghost uh, sector is constructed by using the consultate resolution of the Jacobian idea of your action functional. And then for what concern the action uh, is still that this can be constructed. Um, anyhow, so the whole point is that uh, the ghosts are related to the symmetry of the action functional. So uh, for the model, so we want to perform this extension. So the idea, is, as I told you, is to use this consultate resolution. So this consultate resolution, it really looks like, so it's something that um, tells you how to introduce new variables, so, so step by step, and this new variable will have actually decreasing degree because what we're constructing is a space of anti-ghost and alternating parity. So we want to construct a free resolution of this quotient that is a differential OX algebra. So we are going to have a complex uh, um, finite generator OX modules with a boundary, and they, uh, we are indeed imposing that is a free resolution, so it's exact. So this is somehow the kind of process that one has to go through to perform this computation. So here you start uh, introducing what is needed in degree minus one, and then you keep going with uh, lower degree variables. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, so for me, this is just going to be polynomials because it's uh, the st structural ring of the fine space. So it's just polynomials in a uh, real. Yeah. And uh, in degree minus one, we have the anti fields corresponding to the initial fields. So this first step is uh, somehow fixed because you know, in this kind of symmetry between ghosts and anti ghosts to the initial fields, we have to associate something in degree minus one. Uh, but then, I mean, uh, uh, after this step, you have really to perform this construction and tr kill step by step the generators of uh, the homology group. So to impose that the sequence is going to be exact. And the point is that actually the number of these lower degree new variables is related to the symmetries of your action functional. So here I'm just saying to you, okay, what it looked like in my case. So I've been studying uh, a certain family of actions appearing. So here I'm just telling you what it is like uh, one of the easy cases. So when uh, you're dealing with a, a, an action functional of this kind, you see that this is, of course, uh, invariant under the joint action of UN, so it works. Um, and in this case, if you perform that kind of computation, you see that you, you find, uh, for example, in degree uh, one, uh, so 
in this number of in the generators that somehow they're telling you about the symmetry appearing between pairs of variables in your action functional. And if you go in higher degree, so this uh, goes on degree two, are responsible to somehow killing the symmetries appearing between triples of variable in the action. Yes, you're right. I was, uh, uh, yeah, okay, so the idea is that uh, I started with my, my finest petrol triple. I constructed the gauge theory. The gauge theory has, has configuration space just an affine space, a real affine space of dimension n squared. So my xi in this case are just the real variables uh, for the affine space. Uh, at this point, uh, you don't see it. So it appears in somehow indirectly on the fact that indeed you were uh, dealing with matrices, but at this point, uh, it's... Uh, so your variables are, are commutative at this point. No, the gauge t symmetries are, I mean, uh, here you have, you have UN. So uh, it, it's your, your action functional, turn, uh, it's uh, um, invariance and the, jo the joint action of UN. And uh, then you can actually construct the extended action uh, and uh, for this case, uh, so I mean somehow the formula is, looks a bit ugly, but the whole point is that it turned out to be linear in the anti-fields and the anti goes and quadratic in the ghost fields. And because we had a finite resolution for uh, the ghost sector, we can find an exact solution for the classical master equation. Uh, as I said, so once you do know what is uh, your BV, um, theory, you can indeed construct a corresponding BV complex. And then the construction uh, keeps going because uh, actually, if you want to be able to perform a gauge fixing, you might need to have a, I mean, variable, uh, so other variables, so namely fields uh, um, and Gauss fields in degree minus one. So if you want to perform the gauge fixing procedure, what you need is a gauge fixing fermion, so a function that is actually of degree minus one, uh, but only depending on fields and ghost fields. And here is actually what uh, Thomas was already asking. So of course, uh, then you know, I need uh, uh, to introduce other auxiliary fields uh, that allow you to define a gauge fixing fermion that depends only on uh, ghost and fields and uh, ghost fields, uh, but should have negative ghost degree. And for how we perform the construction, these were not available yet. Yes. Yeah, okay, so in this kind of uh, construction, so the one that uh, was appearing in this uh, Felder and Karzan paper, so what they were doing was uh, really performing the Tate resolution, taking that to construct uh, the space of uh, anti-ghost, and then somehow doubling it. So, so this is why, as I said, so the, all the ghosts uh, appear to have like strictly positive degree. Yeah, so there are other approaches. Yeah, I mean, as I said, so the idea is that you are performing this resolution and this gives you both the ghost and anti-ghost sector. So this is uh, how this construction is, uh, is done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as I was saying, so if you think about uh, step uh, three in this kind of construction is uh, indeed somehow a technical step in order to allow you to perform uh, the gauge fixing procedure and uh, this goes through the introduction of auxiliary fields for which one of course wants to have uh, the, the, the underlying BV complex that doesn't change so auxiliary fields should define what are called like contractible pairs so not changing the underlying cohomology and it's just somehow determined by what is called the level of reducibility of your theory so namely what is the lowest degree of ghosts you do have appearing already in your theory. Uh, but uh, once you do this step, so this is the uh, diagram you ended up having, so you do have your BV extended theory and you introduce these auxiliary fields, uh, obtaining what I call this a uh, total theory. And uh, th with this extra condition that nothing changes if we look to the corresponding cohomology complexes, namely they are quasi-isomorphic. 
once this is done, you can actually perform your gauge fixing procedure. So you're allowed to define your gauge fixing fermion as indeed uh, a regular function of degree minus one only in fields and ghost fields. And then you just perform the gauge fixing. So you restrict it to the Lagrangian sum manifold uh, obtained by uh, imposing the gauge fixing condition. And the last question one can ask is what happens at the level of the cohomology and one can speak about the, uh, I mean the corresponding BRSD cohomology complex, where now we don't have anti-ghosts anymore. And this is what is my goal. So this is what I will call the BV construction in my perspective. <laughs> so uh, as I said, the first step is in your extension with uh, you know, ghosts and anti-ghosts, auxiliary fields, and performing the gauge fixing, and a lower level, what happens for the cohomology. And of course, one can ask, okay, why all of that? Because actually, somehow this cohomology, as I already said, um, I mean, previously, capture relevant physical information, so the classical observable for the initial theory, as well as obstruction to the quantization. Yes, I mean, it's exactly this point. So here, so you do perform your gauge fixing. So you uh, are at the level of the um, co-chains. You're just restricting to the, I mean, you're really getting rid of some of the generators. So uh, for the BV, uh, you had here all the anti-ghosts and anti-fields appearing. Um, for the BRSD, you don't have them anymore uh, because I uh, see you're restricted here, so they're not appearing anymore. And uh, for the co-boundary operator, you take your action and then you impose the gauge fixing condition. Yes, yes, because here you're actually, uh, yeah, you're actually performing. So you somehow, so you, for example, this is a double-sided complex. So this is only one-sided complex. Because here you have only not negatively graded generators. Uh, I mean, uh, here on the nose, because I constructed that. Uh, between this one, I don't know. I mean, not so trivially for sure, because as I was said, um, the so the one is double-sided and the other not. So it could be, but I definitely not on the nose. And. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is uh, the BB part, so now what I want to do. So the other point is that, of course, uh, one uh, see that the BB uh, BRSD complex, uh, so I made it evident that uh, ghost fields play an interesting role, so they're not just tool for solving a problem, but can encode also some structures, some uh, interesting geometrical structure of your gauge theory. So uh, to get, uh, we started this project with Walter von Seinecom, and we had a couple of questions we want to um, answer, namely uh, considering the deep relations that exist between non-commutative geometry and gauge theories, can we actually describe the BV construction in terms of spectral triples? So somehow it feels really needed because, I mean, BV construction is a, a key construction that appears in the setting of uh, gauge theories. If we're claiming that indeed spectral triple encode gauge theory, this construction should be finding a nice explanation in this uh, formalism. But then also, so can we say something for the cohomology, for example? So can we relate the BRSC cohomology to other cohomological theory appearing in the setting of uh, spectral triple? So rephrasing this uh, as in <laughs> these questions with a diagram, this is what we want to complete. So uh, here was our starting point. So we have an initial spectral triple. And then I, I told your recipe to uh, associate to that an initial gauge theory. Then somehow I explain you all these passages where here we were introducing ghost for ghost, here auxiliary fields, and finally we were performing a, a gauge fixing. And now the question is uh, what happens at the higher level? can we somehow find in a BV spectral triple, so a spectral triple that encodes this BV extension, can we find something that also uh, accounts for auxiliary fields? And finally, can we describe the gauge fixing fermion and the gauge fixing procedure at this level? Everything, of course, should be somehow coherently mixing with this, I mean, what happens at the level of cohomology, so somehow a BV extended theory always induces very naturally a BV complex, uh, so can we perform something that, I mean, can we have a BV spectral triple that's induced naturally a, a complex that is actually mix, mixing with this uh, 
um, BV1, and so on. And finally, can we perform everything at the level of non-commutative geometry? So can we completely lift this BV construction to the level of spectral triple? So in particular, given an initial spectral triple, can we um, somehow um, uh, extract directly the information about how many ghosts we need, how the extended action look, and all this kind of information. So the key step is actually the first one. So how to construct what I call a BB spectral triple. So imagine that you're given your initial spectral triple. We know that we can associate a gauge theory and we know how we can perform a BB construction. The question is what do we put here? So a first thing that I have to uh, tell, I mean to remember somehow, is that when we're dealing with finite spectral triple, they are actually naturally defined over complex numbers. Uh, and on the other hand, when we do consider the S uh, tilde, in this one, in this function, they appear Grassmannian variables. So up to now, uh, on this side of the story, none of this was actually there, so we didn't have Grassmannian variables. The way to solve the first uh, problem is just introducing an extra ingredient that is called a real structure. So this is the way to somehow to go from C to R. So a real structure for a spectral triple is just an antilinear isometry defined over the Hilbert space such that it satisfies a couple of conditions. So if it squares, it squares to either plus or minus the identity, and either it commute or anti-commute with the operator D. And uh, this uh, possibility of science uh, goes, I mean, somehow traces back to this uh, uh, table. So when you speak about the KO dimension of your uh, real spectral triple, because then, of course, I mean, if you take your spectral triple with J, this is called a real spectral triple, despite it's not a triple anymore, but this is how it's called in literature. And that's allowed to solve the first problem. Uh, the second problem is. Uh, how do we deal with the appearance of Grassmannian variables in uh, the action? And this is where indeed what we were discussing earlier uh, comes back. So there are two notions of action that naturally appear in the context of spectral triple. So the first one is the notion of spectral action, that is the one that we have been using for constructing our model. And the second is the, act the notion of a fermionic action where you see that actually what enters the game is the inner product structure over the Hilbert space, then you still have your operator D and you can have your real structure. And this is uh, somehow you can consider, so I mean, uh, as a domain, some subspace of your Hilbert space and you can impose that actually you're dealing with elements of Grassmannian nature. So all these ingredients together are telling us that if we want to be able to associate it to our initial spectral triple, what we call a BV spectral triple, this is actually what we have to expect. So it's going to be a real spectral triple, somehow to indeed go from C to R, and somehow what is going to play a role is going to be the fermionic action. So of course the two questions are how the we can find the ghost fields encoded in the initial spectral triple, uh, which role they're going to play in the new one, and what about the extended action? So we we do have the we do expect that to be a fermionic action, but how can we determine that just from the initial spectral triple? So I will tell you the solution for a U2 model that is a little bit I mean, smaller. And so the answer is that actually what is going to play a role is the Hilbert space. So this is my model for uh, n equal to 2. The Hilbert space is just uh, C2. And the idea is that uh, here is where the ghosts will appear. And uh, in this case, you do have that your action is zero as uh, this form here. And you can see that there are uh, three independent uh, uh, symmetries between pairs of coordinates. So you do want to have three ghosts of degree one. And you do have one symmetry that involves all three variables. So you're going to have one ghost of degree two. And yeah. Um, uh, I mean, maybe you're, uh, I, 
Okay, so I don't know exactly how you, what you mean with translation in the sense that, I mean, physically speaking, I'm somehow describing the, a gauge theory of a point. So, <laughs> yeah, I see. Yeah, so here I'm somehow just telling you how, I mean, uh, you can somehow extract the information that were playing a role in computing the resolution from uh, the action here. And as I said, so the ghost sector is actually going to appear in the Hilbert space. And here you see that actually, uh, so it, it's getting quite bigger. So what is going to be our uh, HB is again, of course, you know, you do have this symmetry goes anti ghost so this is why you do have this kind of uh, structure, this is splitting, so here is the ghost sector, is, uh, here is the anti ghost sector, and for what concerns the ghost, so you do have, you know, uh, degree zero part, degree one, and degree two. And the last ingredient is uh, the real structure, this is actually what is, as I said, I mean, is, uh, I mean uh, naturally defined, and allows to go to real uh, variables. Uh, the other important thing is how to construct the extended action, and I told you that in this kind of setting, uh, the uh, extended action turned out to be linear in the anti-fields, anti-ghost, and quadratic in the ghost. And uh, then one can somehow see that uh, you can construct your BV operator, I mean, somehow by imposing these conditions. So remember, we want to encode as tilde as the fermionic action. So as uh, what is determined by taking the pairing with uh, uh, you know, uh, your element in the Uber space, in our case with the real structure, and uh, D apply to the same element. So of course, D, D is what is going to encode the, uh, the, the action. And I mean, as I said here, for example, the fact that it's uh, linear in the anti-ghost is what is giving you zero here. Of course, the operator should be uh, self-adjoint is one of the conditions for spectral triple. And then other, these other conditions here somehow have some kind of, um, I would say, translation in the structure of the operator. And the last ingredient is the algebra. So the algebra is defined to complete what was determined by the ghost sector and uh, the fermionic action to a spectral triple. And in this U2 model, it's just uh, the algebra we started with. So the way how the BV spectral triple encodes your um, BV extended theory is the following. So you can find your X tilde by, I mean, taking some of the initial fields and the ghost sector and your BV action is given in terms of the fermionic action of uh, the um, spectral triple. So this is uh, how to perform the first step of the story. Uh, this already this first step is quite interesting from the perspective of uh, um, non-commutative geometry and spectral triple because it actually uh, leads us to finding this phenomena of uh, 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 an operator D that only partially commutes and partially anti-commutes with the real structure. So somehow we have a mixed curve dimension phenomena appearing. And this is somehow indeed due to the presence of ghosts and anti-ghosts and how they react one to each other. And uh, yes, and somehow this is uh, how things work. So if you want to have the BV construction and the level of spectral triple, so the algebra, we realize that it's not exactly what plays a role, it's simply what completes uh, the uh, other triple with you know, the Hilbert space, uh, the operator D and real structure to a spectral triple. What plays a role is the Hilbert space, uh, and this is what encodes the ghost and anti-ghost sector, and uh, is constructed in order to keep track of the ghost degree. And uh, the action, uh, uh, so the operator DB is what actually Con somehow contains the information about the action SPV, and the real structure is what is required to be able to speak about real fields. 
So schematically, uh, the way how given our initial spectral triple you construct during this gauge theory is the following. So you, the algebra is what gives you the configuration space and the pair of your uh, operator and you know your function is what gives you the real, uh, so sorry, the um, uh, spectral action. While when you want to uh, obtain your BV extended theory given a BV spectral triple, actually the row are a little bit, a bit reversed. So here the configuration space, the extended configuration space with ghost sector and anti ghost is encoded in the Hilbert space. And the action function also, your SBV is given by the fermionic action. Uh, I mean, here we are before that, so this is still a classical theory. So, um, because uh, am I, uh, S tilde is solving the classical Maxwell equation. So, um, yeah, there is still no Laplace at this level. Uh, I mean, I'm somehow rephrasing in terms of spectral triples the BV construction perform at the classical level. So uh, looking for a solution of the classical mass equation. Okay, uh, then uh, of course uh, the natural question is asking once we do have a uh, BV spectral triple, uh, because the BV extended theory somehow naturally induce a cohomology complex. Can we re see that also the level of a spectral triple? So uh, as any BV extended theory naturally induce a BV complex, can we somehow find a way that uh, given a BV spectral triple, we determine a complex that actually is the one we started with? So can we encode also this cohomological um, part in the construction? And of course, in order to answer this question, one might look what are the cohomology theory naturally appear in the context of non commutative geometry, and somehow, the, I mean, what appears naturally is the concept of Hall shield cohomology. So, here is just a quick uh, um, I mean, uh, recall of what is the definition in case of co algebra, so somehow you're dualizing it, because it turned out to be the uh, closest, I mean, the easiest way of dealing with these objects. So somehow one can naturally wonder, can we determine a co-algebra and a co-bimodule such that the corresponding Hoshield complex is actually the BV complex of our BV theory? So yes, the answer is the following. So for the BV, co um, so the bi -co module, you actually start with your initial fields. The co-algebra is, of course, the one containing your uh, Gauss sector. And the uh, bimodal structure here is actually somehow taking care of the zero part. And uh, the co-product is actually taking care of the higher order part. So by plugging this information in, you will see that actually you, uh, so say given your BV spectral triple, the way how you obtain the ingredients needed, uh, so the module somehow comes from the algebra, the Hilbert space is what is determined your um, co-algebra, and then, so these last two ingredients were the one containing the action, so in degree zero determines your bimodal structure, and in degree different than zero determine your a co product, and here is really somehow how it, this look um, at the level of complex. So, you know, you can reconstruct your BV cohomology in these uh, terms from the spectral triple. So, now uh, one know that the, con the construction continues via the introduction of auxiliary fields. So, of course, one wants to be able to continue. So, given your BV spectral triple constructing what I call a total spectral triple, so the one accounting for auxiliary fields. And the interesting thing is that somehow uh, the structure continues. So, once again, no changing at the level of the algebra. So, uh, there is the Hilbert space that will uh, contain also the auxiliary fields. And the uh, operator D, you see that has a very trivial structure, but we do expect that because we don't want to change the underlying cohomology. And uh, here we have the, our BV operators, so this auxiliary part. And this auxiliary part is just taking. Um, 
Uh, so th there are just few parts that are not zero and are the one that determine the contractible pairs. Uh, as I said, so this is uh, the point that uh, in interest to us because there are no, um, so the, the structure repeats somehow. So the total spectral triple has the same structure of our BV spectral triple is completely determined by the level of reducibility, so we don't need to have other information added. So given your BV spectral triple, you can construct your total spectral triple, and at the level of the induced complex, uh, these are quasi-isomorphic. So somehow all of this is summarized in this diagram, where, uh, I mean, this is what happens with the spectral triple system. I told you that this first step goes through the introduction of ghost fields, this second through the introduction of auxiliary fields, and given your spectral triples, this encodes your BV extended theory as well as you can deduce what are these two ingredients, so your co-algebra and co-module, and these uh, two separately induced two complex that actually turn out to be uh, the same cohomology complex, and exactly the same replicates at the level of the total spectral triple. And as I said, all of this is coherent, so you don't need to perform any different constructions. So it really is uh, all coherent in this diagram. Last question is what happens uh, after, you know, performing the gauge uh, procedure, the gauge fixing, so that can we describe that at the level of the spectral triple and what happens for the BV BRST complex? So, and the idea is that, uh, yes, also in this case, so you can find this relation between the cohomology complex and this just goes by uh, performing the gauge fixing, so that also works. And this allowed to complete the diagram. So, uh, we started with our initial spectral triple and we were able to uh, construct the, all the BV construction. So, what we reached and the goal we reached was somehow to lift the construction at the level of a spectral triple by introducing this notion of, of a BV spectral triple, a total spectral triple, and as I said, a gauge fixing in this kind of uh, uh, language. And uh, we somehow uh, find a way to indeed uh, relate a cohomology complex naturally induced by a spectral triple to the uh, BV complex appearing at the level of our BV theory. So somehow we managed to uh, complete this diagram, uh, as I said, also introducing having here a relation with a cohomology complex naturally appearing in this setting. Uh, so these are where indeed the goals, so somehow determining how uh, in the initial spectral triple encodes information needed to indeed construct the BV, uh, the BV theory, so how to extract from our initial geometrical object the needed information. Uh, uh, somehow establish how ghosts and uh, ghosts for ghosts uh, play a role uh, at the level of BV spectral triple so where they are, so namely in the Hilbert space, and finally what happens for the cohomology. As uh, uh, already clear from your questions, of course, as I said, okay, all fits well together, we are happy for that. Uh, but as uh, um, coming from your question already, uh, there are still many aspects that need to be uh, considered because uh, as pointed out before, uh, we still need to go quantum. So that was a solution of the classical master equation. One might ask, okay, uh, how can we uh, perform this construction one, uh, with a, a classic, uh, sorry, a quantum uh, action, so a solution of the quantum master equation. And uh, so we do expect a change of the construction of the level of the operator. And uh, while the ghost sector is going to be, uh, uh, stays unchanged, so the Hilbert space will be unchanged, we do expect that we need to change the operator DB. Uh, as already pointed out from another question, of course, one wants to see what happens if we, instead of considering a theory over a point, we actually extend, so to the case of, for example, a four-dimensional space-time, so what happens if we take a spectral triple over uh, I mean, an infinite dimensional algebra. Because remember, so somehow that was uh, our leading idea, so that we do have somehow that's uh, the way how uh, non commutative geometry encodes interesting gauge theory is uh, somehow, as, I mean, preliminary as a product of two parts. So, what we have been doing right now was studying classes for this part, so for the finite uh, spectral triple. 
uh, of course, I mean, uh, interesting models involves also these other components. And uh, that this is indeed how the action of the full standard model appears in this context. So this is obtained by a part that is a spectral action and a part that is a fermionic action. So the model we studied was somehow a finite uh, non-commutative spectral triple with action functional coming as spectral action of our spectral triple. Of course, I mean, two ways of generalizing it is go infinite dimensional on one side and look what happens if we also consider this other contribution. So, and this is uh, like the final answer to your initial question. <laughs> So here, oh yeah, I mean, sorry, it's just that uh, um, for the finite case, you can somehow uh, twist the operator. So, so it, it, you can, mm, because in the model, uh, your phi is a, a self-adjoint matrix as well as D. So by redefining. Yeah, but I mean, it was constructed as, uh, um, you remember, like sums of products of an element of the algebra times the commutator with this. So when you're dealing with matrices, plus imposing that was self-adjoint. Well, that definition for matrices is self-adjoint matrices. And your D in that case is also self-adjoint matrix. So somehow by redefining your D, you incorporate, because it's like the zero fixed plus phi self-adjoint matrices. So yeah, but it's the same definition. Uh, but yeah, uh, as uh, it's clear, so there is uh, still a long way to go. Uh, but this is, uh, as I said, still open. Maybe in two years' time, I will be able to report of some of that. But uh, for now, I would like to thanks for the attention. Thanks a lot.